thanks very much for the final session of the conference, uh, leaving aside the reception, which will follow this. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to introduce, it's uh, very proud to introduce Madeline Penman. Madeline is a PhD student with ANCLIS, uh, started quite recently, and she's going to be studying uh, for a PhD, doing research on gold mining in Mexico and Peru. But Madeline is in some ways much more experienced than an early uh, career, an early PhD student. She's done a lot of work already in Latin America, both in Peru and particularly in Mexico. And you'll see from her biography here that she's had some very high profile jobs in both places, including being coordinator of the international area of the Center for Human Rights, blah, 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 uh, in Mexico City. There's a long, long title for that and uh, also parliamentary liaison for the office in Mexico of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. So she's got extensive, uh, extensive experience in Latin America and extensive experience academically as well. So Madeline is speaking on mining in Latin America, the behaviour of companies. Thank you, John. And thank you to everybody for making it to the end of two days and staying here to support my presentation. So I'm very happy for that. <laughs> Uh, before I get started as well, I'd like to acknowledge John, who is the supervisor of my PhD, and he's been very helpful in this process. So today I'll be giving you an overview of what's an exploratory area that I'm looking into to provide some preliminary conclusions on this beast that is the mining company that we understand very little, but we talk about so much. So I'm trying to get to the bottom of how mining companies work. Throughout these two days, we've talked about mining companies a lot, but actually going inside them uh, is something I think that we can do a lot more on. Diana spoke a little bit about it in the afternoon session, and uh, Kieran actually referred to it as well a little bit. So I think I'll leave you with this at, at the end of the two-day session, and we'll see where these preliminary conclusions can take us. But first of all, a little bit of context that we've pretty much talked about already. We know that Latin America and the Caribbean is receiving the most foreign direct investment in mining exploration in the world. So it far surpasses Africa. It's taking 30, over 30 percent of uh, direct investment in mineral exploration. And it's a new geography of investment. It's a new type of investment. And what I mean by that is in a high price scenario in this recent mining boom, mining companies will explore in areas that they previously had not explored in. So they're willing to look for what we call lower grade ores, which basically means digging in areas that before would not have been profitable. So it's a very aggressive exploration uh, process that has been taking place in the last uh, decade. And I've got this, uh, this graph here, which I really tried to put in this diagram, which is in terrible resolution here, but I was tempted to put it up anyway. It comes from a geographer, Gavin Bridge, from a 2004 article. Now I'm going to have to show you really what this means because from the back there you won't be able to see it. But what we're talking about is with the change of this geography of mining in Latin America, you see a lot of open pit mining, which are large transformations of landscape involving a lot of waste and a lot of use of water. So in this diagram here, what you have are different minerals and the amount of waste that they use. So my interest and what I'll be focusing on in this presentation is precious metals. So gold, silver and copper as well. Okay? Now, if you see, you've got the grey areas in these little pie graphs is the amount of waste that is produced when these minerals are extracted. So here you've got coal with a fair amount of waste and, and here is the, in the white area, this is the mineral that's actually produced. This is petroleum here on the right, so you've got a lot of mineral produced, and this is the amount of waste that you have, for example. Um, another one here is stone construction products, stone products. You get a lot of material produced and a very, few, very little waste. But let's contrast this now with gold, all right? So you cannot actually see the amount of mineral that's produced when you're talking about gold. It's a tiny, tiny amount of gold for the number of tonnes of waste that is being produced. And copper is down here. So gold and copper are both uh, very toxic mineral extraction processes. And no matter what side of the industry you're on, whether you're pro-mining or anti-mining, this is a commonly accepted uh, uh, view or a commonly accepted piece of data that that precious metal mining uses the most water and the most waste in the business. 
So of course this means that we have changing landscapes and changing livelihoods going on. And yesterday in the introduction, uh, Tony Anthony Bemington talked a lot about how this is transforming the landscape of mineral extraction in the region and the conflicts related to it. So on that note, in this context, we know that socio-environmental conflicts have increased. And I won't go into this too much because it's really not the area of my presentation. But it's just important to remind ourselves that the data coming out of offices such as the Peruvian Ombudsman has showed us that social conflicts are increasing, have been increasing during each month throughout the mining boom from 2004 onwards approximately. So for example, in uh, 2005, we had 73 social conflicts as opposed to 247 registered in one month in June 2012. Now, not all these social conflicts are related to mining, but a very large percentage of them are. So there's a lot of different registers. There's also the Latin American Observatory on Mining Conflicts, OCLAM. There's a number of different measurements that are telling us that increased extraction is, is accompanied by increased conflict. So the conflict that is going on uh, is often linked to social movements that are increasingly better articulated and more united. And so trans Latin American slogans have been taken on board, such as uh, el agua vale más que el oro, so water is more important than gold, or life is more important than gold. And communities affected by mining projects are aware of what is going on. And uh, in an anonymous interview I had with a mining company representative a few months ago, he said, you know, even the most remote community will know what the spot price of gold is. You know, it really is a piece of knowledge that is a commodity, if you like, for everybody. People know when the profit is high and therefore when the cake is bigger, as Mauricio would have said from yesterday. Okay, so we know that conflicts have increased and we know that these catch cries of the movement have become more united across the region. So academic literature also has looked at this phenomenon and a lot of this work has been done by geographers, by people in the discipline of political ecology, by uh, Bebington here present, which we're very grateful for, and uh, Javier Ariano Yaguas, Jose de Chave, so lots of other uh, authors are starting to talk about these conflicts. So what do we know about mining conflicts? We know that we know about the causes of conflicts, and there's literature that tells us why these conflicts are taking place and how they come about. I'm going to summarise it uh, with some with a useful publication that came out from Grade, I think, Tank in Peru, uh, last year. And they summarised these discussions in four points, four causes of mining conflicts in this most recent millennium mining boom. They said, number one, we see new mining areas being opened up. So rather than the old traditional mining communities that have had the presence of companies for decades or possibly centuries, what you see is mining companies are moving into areas that they had not been in before. So agricultural communities, for example, are having to give up their livelihoods. So this change in the frontier of mining is a huge cause of conflict. The second cause that is often talked about is the shift of conflicts away from the traditional uh, disputes over labour and jobs, who gets what in relation to the project, and it's become a lot more related to environmental concerns. So the incidence of conflicts over water, biodiversity and so forth is much higher. And that's largely related to this new geography of mining that I talked about at the start, that the incidence of open pit mining, of large holes in the ground that irrevocably change the landscape, this is something that has changed a lot with new technology that has come on board. So this new uh, these new different demands that are starting to take over from traditional demands, that's another cause of conflict. Uh, the third cause, of course, is the excessive rents that are there for the taking and the distributive conflicts that arise over who gets what and the sharing of these revenues is, of course, a clear cause of the conflict. The fourth cause that is often talked about is perhaps uh, less visible but nevertheless at work in terms of causes of uh, relating to violence and corruption that are already pre-existing in some of the regions and some of the communities. Now, you'll see that the countries that I examined today that I use as examples, Mexico and Peru and Argentina, all have pre-existing power structures that are going on and things, stories behind what we see that are very important to take into account in terms of these factors. 
So the academic literature tells us about the causes of conflicts, and it's a really important literature, so we, we know something about that. We also know we have academic literature that tells us how community of demands are classified, how we can conceive of community demands. Now, there's, a lot to, there's lots of ways to look at what communities are doing, why they're doing it, and what they ask for. So, again, Anthony Bemington has great research on this, and he has a, uh, an article from 2009 that provides a compelling classification of community demands in Peru, and he classifies five types of conflicts that are going on and five ways that communities are asking for certain things. They may ask for conservation demands, which may mean the preservation of a certain area of biodiversity within the mining project's limits. They may have nationalist or populist demands, and they may be looking for distributive goals, which is basically they may be looking to share in the sovereign resource that they believe pertains to them as part of the people of their country. So that's a second demand. There may be livelihood ecology demands where people express fundamental concerns over how their, uh, their mode of living or their access to livelihood may change. Then there are perhaps more radical demands, if you like, social environmental justice demands, demands that are linked up with human rights movements. And finally, deep ecology demands, as Anthony names them, that assert that fundamental rights and the rights of nature are just as equal to the imperatives of development and that nature has an equal right to life as human beings and that mining should not take place on any account. So these are some of the ways that that conflicts are classified, but there are other ways to classify conflicts. So the World Gold Council separates mining conflicts into ideological ones, psychological, cultural mining conflicts. Uh, there are many ways um, to measure community demands and to classify them. So that is part of the literature. We know that communities are asking for different things at different points in different ways. Some of this literature on community demands as well, a lot of this literature, I should say, does point out the fact, and we've heard this during the conference, that there is a clear asymmetry of power going on, that you've got communities that have a disadvantage in terms of the access to information and resources they have vis-a-vis -vis the mining company. So in no way in the rest of this presentation do I want to lose sight that I do understand and acknowledge that this asymmetry of power is going on, but I'm trying to look at the interaction between how the company responds to these conflicts. Okay, so you have different languages of valuation, as Juan Martinez Allier would tell us about, values that are clashing and coming into conflict in these mining projects. Okay, so that's what we know mostly from the academic literature on mining conflicts in this most recent boom. But in all of this, where is the mining company? So some academics have noted that we have monolithic or simplistic characteri characterizations of the mining company. So that's from Ballard and Banks. Uh, Diane Kemp from UQ, uh, colleague of, of Diana and Christian, has, has noted that few studies have examined the perspective of mining companies and research data on mines and community conflict are typically collected from a community standpoint. So there is a gap here and uh, Kieran in the morning I was thrilled to hear him say that you know we need to understand more about the mining company in order to really understand what's happening in these inter in interactions. So in that way what do we know so far about what mining companies do? We know that it's a dearth of research in this area, but there are some things that have been said. One of the things, and I agree uh, completely actually with, with Kieran this morning, I use the same terminology that he uses in talking about the literature on corporate social responsibility. So that's perhaps the most developed literature on talking about how, how mining companies relate to communities and how they relate to social issues in mining conflicts. So corporate social responsibility is a field of literature that has uh, developed over the last couple of decades, some of it funded by industry, some of it not. But I would posit that it is mostly a normative field. So either you're for corporate social responsibility or you're against it. And so there's a great article by Sagerben and Williams in, of 2006 that basically categorizes the arguments around corporate social responsibility into four groups. 
Some people will say it's either good capitalism because it acts as a form of risk management and reputation management, or it's bad capitalism because it undermines the market economy and it interferes with government responsibilities. Or on the other side, some people will say that corporate social responsibility is good development because we're building on the capacity of the private sector and we decrease the burden of regulatory enforcement. Or we could call it bad development because we ignore the structural dimensions of the business relationship with poverty and so forth. But however you look at it, I would say that the literature on corporate social responsibility can only help us to a certain point, and it does have an agenda, either for or against uh, CSR, if you like. So it is a normative field. It's saying what companies should or should not do. And really, to go to the bottom of how companies work, I think perhaps we need to put this literature to the side, if you like, and just look at companies as actors that have motivations and start from, from scratch, if you like. So in that respect, we do have some literature that has emerged from the University of Queensland and Harvard on how mining companies perceive costs in conflict and how they shape their decisions based on cost. So Daniel Franks uh, from the University of Queensland has talked about this, and I'm going to quote him a little bit. And also, again, Diane Camps has talked about the importance of understanding organisational dynamics within a company. So the people within a company matter. As uh, Diana said again in her presentation before, if we have strong leaders within a company, things can perhaps be different. If we have technical departments in a company that are more open to collaborating with company, uh, community relations departments, that is a big difference. So it's not a monolithic, a monolithic entity again, it's a living and breathing entity, this mining company. So these are some things that have been said about company responses. But nevertheless, I would, I would say that none of these explanations really tell us, and the research is scarce on telling us how market conditions, so high prices, low prices, for example, how market conditions shape the behaviour of mining companies. And that's really where my research is trying to head towards. So, you know, companies as economic actors, how are they shaped by market conditions? So in that respect, are mining companies more likely to concede to community demands during mining booms or less likely to concede? Are they going to be more likely to give a little or are they going to be more reticent to, to give in? Okay? So in that respect, there's a, there's a lacuna or there's a gap in the research on mining in this respect. You can find, however, analogous work that is well developed in relation to strikes in industrial relations literature that goes back many decades. So when you talk about business cycles of boom and bust, what we do know is that uh, during times of economic prosperity, people are more likely to strike and are more likely to have social demands uh, towards big business. So we do know that this is an area that has been well proven. It may be counterintuitive because we may think when people have low wages, they'll be more annoyed and they'll be more likely to strike. Well, it's actually the other way. When people are living reasonably well, they can see that times are prosperous, there's a bigger cake to take a bit from, and demands will go up. And accordingly, the literature from industrial relations does tell us that uh, outcomes tend to be more favourable when we're in a prosperous time. And so there are a number of publications from bargaining theory, industrial relations theory, going back to the 60s, uh, from a number of authors. So for example, I'll just quote one here from Orley and Johnston in 1969, management is more likely to give in when profits are high and the union is more likely to increase its demands. We also know that in the post-World War II golden age of capitalism that lasted a number of decades, this was a time when labour and big capital had an unprecedented uh, uh, negotiating amicability, if you like, that hadn't yet been seen before. In prosperous times, the industrial relations literature tells us that uh, big business will be more likely to give in to, to workers' demands. Now, I'm not saying that we can translate that literature directly over to the extractive industries sector because it's a completely different area and in talking about Latin America there are completely different dynamics going on. We do know, however, that 
There's also work from social movements literature telling us how social movements are more likely to succeed and when they campaign against economic actors, how economic actors such as business are going to think. And there's work from Joseph Luders from the American Journal of Sociology in 2006 that provides an overview on how businesses think when civil society is rallying against it. And so businesses will either be accommodators, vacillators, conformers or resistors. So these are some areas that we can draw on when thinking about the extractive industry. However, we need to go into it from a fresh start and, and perhaps explore some of or the cases in front of us. So what do we know about the motivations of mining companies? So what I've done for this paper, uh, I've taken 19 case studies of mining conflicts from 2002 to 2012 from Mexico, Peru and Argentina. Uh, they're all foreign owned Canadian uh, mid to senior companies that are all carrying out open cut mines in the region. So mostly gold mines with some silver and copper involved. However, I should have mentioned before that gold and silver are often found in the same vein. So you're often, often extracting the same minerals together and they're similar processes. However, I do want to point out that these, and these 19 cases that I've taken are purely for uh, the purpose of an analysis and they're by no means all of the open pit conflicts that are going on. They're by no means all of the large, uh, large mines in Latin America. I've used as the main source uh, uh, a website of, of McGill University, which is the McGill Research Group investigating mining conflicts in Latin America. So basically the data set was there, was well uh, categorised with synopses of conflicts, and I've just basically classified it in another way in order to find some analytical conclusions. Okay, and what I've done is classified, uh, I've come up with a study that tries to classify company responses into four archetypes of how companies respond. So four types of company responses. And I did this by classifying company responses according to different criteria that would influence their response. So price changes is a fundamental factor that will influence how companies respond. So we know that gold prices rose by more than six times between 2002 and 2010. So they rose steadily from, let's say, 283 US dollars in 2000 to 1,813 per ounce in mid-2011. So, and the sharpest increases happened from 2004 onwards. Silver and copper prices also rose, not as dramatically as gold, and they did have a few drops mostly relating to the financial crisis, but however recovering soon afterwards. So the rentability of extraction is obviously something that's going to affect companies, and I've used price changes as part of the analysis. I've also looked at the regulatory framework uh, in the different countries uh, at hand, and in this sense uh, I've used the rankings from uh, the Fraser Institute's annual mining survey, which has been published since 1996. So a big Canadian think tank that looks at uh, dozens of mining jurisdictions around the world and interviews mining companies to rank these jurisdictions and how favourable they think they are in terms of environmental, social, fiscal and administrative regulations. In this ranking, within Latin America, the outliers consistently have been Chile in terms of being the most favourable, from the view of mining companies, the most favourable uh, regulatory environment. And, and the bottom has been consistently uh, Venezuela and uh, Bolivia, to some extent, uh, and, and Honduras have been uh, reasonably close to the bottom. In this respect, I've chosen three countries that have a regulatory framework that has consistently fallen in the middle. So Mexico, Peru and Argentina are more or less in the middle in terms of how mining companies view them uh, for being favourable investment uh, destinations. Argentina was a bit lower, but it's sort of improved in the rankings recently. Politics, of course, at a national and local level is an extremely complex issue, and I don't assume to take it all into account in this humble study, but of course I can't overlook it. So I will be mentioning political factors in this, and it's something that needs a lot more um, analysis. So 
just briefly, Mexico and Peru, they have a history of 500 years of, uh, of mining in their countries. And so you have politics and politicians that are used to being related to mining. Argentina has a shorter life of mining in its country, and only really in the last century has it come into its own. And in the last couple of decades has large-scale mining really opened up in Argentina. Community and community resistance is a factor that's really important. The sort of demands that communities are asking of mining companies, uh, why they're asking them, and the history of resistance in that region and in that community is very important. So in the last decade, there have been some emblematic movements that have been the rally cry of the region, if you like. So starting with 2002 in Campo Grande in Peru, you had a community that successfully stopped uh, a large mining project by holding a community-led referendum and a large, well-organised campaign. And that, that, uh, that successful community resistance, if you like, inspired a lot of resistance from other communities after that. And in Argentina as well, we had the Esquel case in 2003 with a similar community referendum and very well-organised campaign of resistance. So I put those two cases to you as examples that when you have a very well organized community, this is a vital factor in, in understanding the, the company response. I've also included the stage of the mining project of the development, or construction or production stage. And a factor that I won't examine today, but I would like to put it up here, is the internal company dynamics. Having not interviewed, having not done the field work for this research, this is desk-based research, and not having interviewed each company, it would be very difficult to talk about the internal dynamics that are going on. Nevertheless, I think it's an important area and we need to understand how companies, multinationals work within themselves. So this study came up, as I said, with four archetypes out of 19 cases. Archetype, and I use that word, I think I like the idea of archetype because it's, it's not a perfect approximation, it's just a, an exploratory description. So rather than, you know, hard and fast definitions, these are workable, mouldable things. So I think archetype sort of summarises that well. So archetype number one is that companies that cave into community pressure and that terminate the project. That's four out of 19 cases. Archetype number two is the largest representation. So during this mining boom, a number of companies quickly conceded to demands, especially when the, hype, when the, pro, when the price rose. Okay. Archetype number three, I've, I've said, are the stubborn companies, for want of a better word, I've used the word stubborn, that continually insist despite a lot of opposition and decide to stay on. Uh, despite uh, the demands against it. And archetype number four I won't be examining, but I've put it in there because in the data set there were four projects where the regulator shut down the mine or suspended it. Since that is an interaction and an involvement more uh, motivated by the state, I'm leaving that out for now because I'm trying to just examine community company relations, but I'll put it in there so you know where the other four come from. So how am I going for time? Yeah, okay. Great, so archetype number one, company, the company caves into community pressure and terminates the project, walks away or significantly sus suspends the project. So, why do they do this? This is four projects, as I said, out of 19. Um, Motocintla in Chiapas in Mexico, which was terminated in 2009, Cocula in Mexico as well, Fatamina in Argentina and another one in Argentina, Aguarica all by uh, large Canadian mining companies. So why did they do this? Well, I propose that one of the most important factors involved in explaining this is understanding the stage of the project that companies uh, decide to terminate in. Uh, Daniel Franks from the University of Queensland, as mentioned by Dana as well, has done research talking about uh, when, co when companies are more likely to abandon projects. And that's in a pre-production phase. So actually usually the development stage of a project uh, or the feasibility studies and so forth. This is a time when, as Frank says, the capital of the project has not yet been sunk into the landscape. So the money has not yet all been spent. The things have, yet, have not yet all been built. So it's a time when the community realises that they really have some leverage and they can really make the most difference in their demands. Um, 
And it's also a delicate phase where the community has first contact with the company and therefore conflict is more likely to arise. But at the same time, it's more easy to walk away as a company. So if it looks just too hard, that this is going to be a really sticky, messy project with, a, with an unruly community, if you like, the company will say, well, you know, not all the capital has been spent, we can leave it and we can walk away. So all of the four projects were in a pre-production phase and they all terminated under community pressure. Okay, so that's one similarity. The other reason, of course, is a strong opposition from the community. There's a reason why companies walk away. There's a reason why they think the operation will be unfeasible. So in Chiapas, in Mexico, it is a new area for gold mining uh, and therefore there is a lot of resistance from the community because they haven't yet been exposed to this sort of open cut extraction. And there's a very strong movement of indigenous resistance and indigenous, sorry, community resistance often by indigenous groups in Chiapas, as we know. So not an easy operating environment, if you like, for a company. So uh, the same way, Guerrero in Mexico, if you know anything about Guerrero, a hugely uh, political area and a very strong uh, anti-mining movement uh, has, was mounted there and drove out a mining company. The same way in Argentina there are really strong anti-mining movements with a number of provinces uh, actually deciding to pass, to, to pass laws banning the use of cyanide, which of course is a vital uh, chemical in open pit mining. So virtually banning or trying to ban open pit mining. So Argentina has some extremely well organized uh, movements that are united across uh, provinces such as La Rioja, Rio Negro and Catamarca. And you see that all of these four projects, it wasn't just about the stage of the project, it was also about a strong opposition from the company. Another reason that, you know, we could debate about this, but if you look here, the abandonment of these three projects that were abandoned all happened, this is the price of gold, and they all happened when, when the gold price actually went down a little bit. Now, we can debate over how companies think about price and how long-term their projections are, but you know, the fact of the matter is, is that Coca-Cola actually abandoned their project in the time of the financial, global financial crisis, so that clearly has some sense to it. Motozintla also abandoned just here at the start of that dip, the start of 2010, and Fatamina, happened more recently in 2012, this quite, you know, this quite notable dip in the gold price, okay? So price is really important as well in terms of walking away from a project. So I also say that archetype one, why do reasons why companies terminate is because regulatory uncertainty will really turn them off. So this is an example. In the case of, in the, case of the Fatamina mine in, in Argentina, it was originally owned by the largest gold mining company in the world, Barrick Gold. However, there was so much regulatory uncertainty from the province that, uh, that they, they were turned off and they abandoned the project. So within 17 months, the same governor, Berrera-Rera, uh, first passed an anti-mining law outlawing open-cut mining and then changed it and said, no, actually, it's fine, and then went back again and, and changed it back. So you can see how companies will lose trust in the regulatory environment under these conditions. So that's another reason. That's just an example. Now we get to, I'm going to start moving through quite quickly, but this is archetype two, possibly the most important. So the company quickly concedes to demands in the context of higher prices. Okay, and so that's seven out of 19. It was actually eight, but the eighth project I couldn't get enough data on, so Possibly it could be more, but it's seven. So the largest representation of, of the data set are these companies that give more in times of boom. So this is a list of the companies. So you see the big ones there, Gold Corp, Mine Finders, Barrett Gold, and so forth. Okay, so why do they concede to demands? Okay, so in five out of the seven projects, Higher prices were correlated with an improved company response. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take the case of Pierina in, in Peru, a very famous mine that's been in production since 1998. So it's been going for a long time. Conflict, significant conflict started in 2002, but nothing really happened. And at that time, the gold price was still not that great. It was just, you know, it was just still at its 1990s level. Okay, so nothing really happened, no quick changes. 
Uh, yet there was another conflict in 2006. By that time, the gold price was much higher, and suddenly you see an agreement is reached between the company and the community in seven days. So, and at the same time, you see, during those months of 2006, it's actually really interesting to look. In that very month, the gold price had, had had a huge leap. So, you know, these are things that would have to be explored more, but it's interesting to look at these links. So, in another project, there were, uh, in the Mina Dolores mine in, in Mexico, there were two years of major conflict and stagnation, stalemate from the company, no giving in from the company, and then suddenly, Two years later, prices were more favourable and the company decided to give in. Okay, so under higher prices, companies will perhaps have an improved response. And in the remaining three two projects, a high price meant that there was a quick response. So the, the project started in an already high price scenario and the response of the company was pretty quick, was, was almost instantaneous in the same month in terms of accommodating in some way community demands. Okay, so the other reason why companies concede to community de demands, we can talk about political factors. Now this, this uh, example of the Pierina project that I gave where an agreement was suddenly reached in seven days and conflict was abated, it's interesting to note that this happened in 2006 during the pres presidential um, election time. So you can see that it's a time when the when the government perhaps wants to save face and uh, the central government, the Ministry of Mines, quickly deployed its representatives to, sh to calm the conflict and find an agreement. Uh, so politics is also a factor. There was also favourable regulation in all of these eight projects. So in all of these projects, the company f did not appear to be under any significant pressure from regulators. And in those circumstances, they were more likely to give a little, if you like, and of course, we really do need to do more work on, on uh, matching up community demands with company responses. So clearly, the demands in these conflicts, a lot of the time in these eight cases under Archetype 2, were demands for compensation or distributive justice. They weren't demands for closing the project. So we need to have a look at how the company will respond to what the community is asking from it and will be shaped by the demands from communities. Finally, just quickly, all of these pro nearly all of these projects were in production phase. So once you're in production phase, there's really no way back or it's much uh, harder to walk away from the project. So you could posit that companies are more likely to give a little because they're already uh, getting the profits. The profits have come online and the gold is pouring, so perhaps they're more likely to give a little bit in terms of concessions. Okay, so the last archetype, the stubborn company, the company that hangs on no matter what, no matter what happens. All right, so that's four out of the nine projects. And this is a very ambiguous case. This is a very ambiguous set of companies and by no means do I have the answers but I've got some tentative ideas. So two of these projects were in production phase and in that way we can understand well they're already producing it's more difficult to walk away they're not going to give in so easily to community demands but also two of the projects were in development phase but advanced development phase so in some way we can see well, there is a lot of capital there already spent, so there's an incentive to hang on from the company's perspective. But another reason I would say is that when there's, a, there's two cases here, New Gold in Mexico, which is a very famous mine, Cerro San Pedro, and Barrett Gold in Peru in relation to the Pierina mine. These, both these companies had very stubborn responses, sorry, not the Pierina mine, in another Lagunas Norte mine I'm referring to. So I'm talking about, yeah, another barrack project, Lagunas Norte. In both of these projects, the companies uh, rejected uh, legal cases against it, rejected environmental rulings, uh, made statements that said, you know, we're sticking in no matter what, was really not conciliatory. But they had a history in the company. So, for example, in the case of New Gold in San Pedro, in San Luis Potosí, they'd been there since the mid-90s. Their environmental permit had been granted, then revoked, then granted again under a new president, and then I think revoked again. So they were ready to wait it out. You know, they, they, you know, this company could see that 
change would come and eventually, you know, the government would be fickle and they'd get its way eventually. So they were ready to wait it out. Barrett Gold as well in Peru with the Lagunas Norte project, they've got a long history in Peru. And so you could say that the company is willing to wait until conflicts abate and the attitudes of authorities change. Okay, and in all of these projects, of course, the price was favourable. And to some extent, regulatory impediments could be over, overcome or were thought to have been overcome. However, I would posit this, this final archetype really needs more examination, and these stubborn companies, if you like, are an ambiguous uh, factor that we need to look into. And of course, we have to look at the fact that companies are the more powerful actor when looking at uh, the conflict they have with communities. Finally, as I said before, there is a fourth archetype, but I won't be examining it today. In four of the cases out of the 19 that I looked at, the company committed such flagrant violations of environmental law or human rights provisions that they were actually shut down quite early on in the project. So I won't go into them, but if you're interested, I could tell you about them. So conclusions, as I said, this is an exploratory work. However, I think it's important to start opening up discussions about how companies think, how companies respond. You know, we all know that companies are there to make a profit, to maximise their shareholder benefit, and that it's an industry based on costs, and really costs are what will shape uh, the sector. So just an overview is that in 78% of these cases that I've examined, in some way mining companies capitulated to demands against them. So it's interesting, and it's a context I've chosen of increasing prices. So in increasing prices in times of boom, you see a fair amount of companies giving in because there's a lot at stake and there's a lot to be lost. So the tentative conclusion is that mining booms result in a willingness to struggle on the part of communities and a willingness, a willingness to concede on the part of companies. So thank you very much and that's, I'll get to the, that's the end of it. Yeah. In terms of uh, uh, prices, I agree and I do think the, the research is rather simplistic, assuming that with increased prices suddenly it explains everything, there's a rush to dig, there's a rush to extract and therefore you know, the profits are big and everything's easy for the industry. Well, when really you understand that the way costs are conceived is not just about the price. And so that correlation between price and response needs to be made a lot more subtle. I definitely agree with you on that. Um, in terms of conflict studies, I think that, uh, conflict resolution studies, I think that there needs to be more of a crossover between conflict literature and what we're talking about in the extractive industries because, because we have literature from, you know, resource curse literature on conflict that tells us that the incidence of uh, civil wars are higher with, you know, resource ex extraction in Africa. So the classics, Paul Collier and Ross and things, but I don't think there's been that a marrying up of conflict resolution literature with extractive industries. So I also take that as a suggestion. In terms of Rio Tinto uh, and its experiences in Bougainville, yeah, it's going back a little, you know, a number of years ago. And I do think the industry has changed in a way since then. I wouldn't, because I'm not studying Rio Tinto's activities in Latin America, I, I really can't comment too much. But I do know that they've got a new project in Peru, which is uh, involved with a lot of deal. Um, relocation of communities and so they're going to face a lot of challenges and I'm sure they'll have to reflect on on earlier um, slips and so great question so with the question on corporate social responsibility uh, just to start off with um, to note that a number of these companies in the data set are members of global umbrella bodies such as the International Council on Mining and Metals so you've got Barrick and Gold Corp in there signed up to that. They're big companies with a large budget. And so, in a sense, you could say if they don't have good corporate social responsibility programs, then you know there's no hope for the rest of the industry. Now, um, there was a great piece of data in a, someone else's presentation from yesterday, I think, on the percentage, ah, Christian's presentation, and we'll have to get it up again as an answer to this question, <laughs> on the percentages that companies spend on corporate social responsibility programs within their uh, operations, and it's only less than 1%. So, but nevertheless, I do think the evidence, at least from Peru, is that 
those com those companies that are, have more agile uh, community relations teams and take into account community relations from the start often have better outcomes and so you can look at cases where dialogue has been set up right from the start. Uh, there's a case of uh, Extrata uh, with uh, Tintaya in Peru and uh, it's it's a long, it's a project that's been going on for a lot of years with a negotiating table and it was held up as a success story for many, many years because they had a very fruitful negotiation which went on all the time. But when it stopped for one month, that negotiation broke down and then, it, and then the conflict arose. So really it's all about constant dialogue, constant talking and communication. Um, in terms of demands, definitely the question of Eve, I think it's vital and in a way the aim of this research is to be a counterpart, if you like, to the research that has classified community demands. So if I take, for example, uh, Bemington's classification into five types of community demands or, or conflicts, we need to look at the counterpart and say, well, how does the, uh, the company respond? Are they more likely to uh, walk away when communities ask them to? Are they more likely to give uh, compensation when communities ask them to? So, but I think from this uh, review, it's definitely clear that the nature of the community demand is, is fundamental in determining how the company will respond. So whether they stay or whether they go. So we definitely need to cross over those two factors. Um, in terms of the question on companies and governments, um, it's not really mentioned that much in this presentation, limits of space and time, but I think it's definitely an issue that, that works into this literature. You have Peru, which is very decentralised in its mineral rents, and then you have Mexico, which is very centralised, and you do see a difference there. You see Peru, for example, where the central government will get involved, the mining ministry has a special... Actually, I've met the guy that he calls himself the firefighter, the conflict firefighter, the bombero, and uh, he goes within 24 hours and he, he, he puts out the fires and he puts out the conflict. So the government gets really involved in Peru. They get right on the ground of the community. You know, we could debate about some regions of Peru that are forgotten and so forth. But compared to Mexico, for example, talking to the Mexican government, they said, we don't get involved. That's between the company and the community. So they don't want to get into the sticky business. So there's different ways of doing it. And I think uh, yeah, th that will have to become part of this research. It's not really been developed enough yet. Yeah. I'm going to start. I'm going to go in order. So talking about the behavior of mining companies as being um, having double standards with how they treat workers. In a sense, I'm treating workers as part of the wider community if they come from the community. But further than that, my analysis is not really looking at labor relations as such, unless it is part of one of the community demands. I'd have to look further in order to be able to answer your question, but I've you know, taken note and we can have more of a chat afterwards, Marcos. Um, the links among companies and talking to people who move across companies, I think it's a vital suggestion. And I think that also people that have moved from companies to umbrella bodies, uh, so, you know, again, the International Council on Mining and Metals, or people who have moved from other sectors into companies, so the famous example is uh, John Ruggie, who was the UN representative on uh, business and human rights and now is working for a mining company. So these people are very interesting to see how the, the standards that they've actually invented are working for the industry that they're now involved with. So yeah, those sorts of personalities are vital. Um, underground or overground mining, sorry, underground or open cut mining. I have to, oh, I have this extended interview with a geologist, but from what I can reckon, I think under, uh, open cut mining is cheaper overall in terms of capital versus uh, output versus uh, costs. But yeah, but the the, you've got the problem of the unchangeable effect on the landscape and there's very, very few success stories of how people use that hole afterwards and do something with it. So that's the problem you have. Um, you know, there's the problem, there's a the use of cyanide in open cut mining which is a huge issue. 
Now, we've moved away from using things such as mercury, which is good, but now we have other things. So there's a whole lot of issues there. Um, but however, saying, having said that, there are major cases of conflict in relation to underground mining. So there's an underground silver mine in Mexico that's huge in terms of the protests going on. And then the origin of the company, of course, it's um, definitely a factor. There's you know, there's been a great study done by Tufts University, for example, on Chinese investment in Peru, and it showed that there's this terrible, my, in my opinion, there's this terrible perception that Chinese investors will have lower standards than the rest of the world, and there's no evidence on that. And that example for shows, I just wanted to mention that, shows that Chinese investors will, will you know, abide by regulations just as every, everyone else. But I think the perception that we have will be tainted by the prejudices that people have in terms of Canadian mining, definitely, as Zuleika says, it's sort of thought of as the, the imperialist of the continent. I would like to look at Australian companies in Latin America. There's only about 90 of them, and a lot of them are juniors. Um, but there's not many doing large-scale gold mining, so they're mostly other, you know, they're mostly sort of other minerals. So that's sort of the reason why I'm not so far looking at it. But so just as an example, there's about 90 Australians companies in Latin America, but there's about 220 Australian companies in Africa, so it's not, it's far behind in terms of, yeah. Good. Okay. Thanks, Thanks very much. Cheers.